Welcome to the 16th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee of 2018. Uh, can I ask everyone please to ensure that their mobile phones are off or on silent and uh, please ask not to use uh, uh, mobile devices for photography or recording. The first item on our agenda today is subordinate legislation. We have two negative instruments to consider. Uh, the National Health Service Superannuation Scheme Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Number 2 Regulations 2017 Amendment Regulations 2018 uh, on the, is the first of those, and this is to correct an error identified by the Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee at its meeting on the 16th of January. There has been no motion to annul this instrument. Uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered this instrument, the amendment instrument, and determined it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on any grounds within its remits. Are there any comments uh, from members? If not, does the committee agree to make no recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you very much. The second instrument is the National Health Service Pension Scheme Scotland Additional Voluntary Contributions Regulations 2018. Again, there has been no motion to annul. However, the Delegated Persian Law Reform Committee considered the instrument at its meeting on the 8th of May and agreed to draw the attention of the Parliament on general reporting grounds in respect of four uh, drafting errors. Now, the Scottish Government has indicated in correspondence on these matters that it intends to correct those errors at the next legislative opportunity uh, uh, in the late summer of this year. Uh, are there any comments from members? There being none, clearly it's uh, disappointing that, again, uh, this consolidation instrument has uh, uh, made a number of uh, minor errors, uh, which requires another instrument to come to the committee at a later date. However, uh, if there are no comments from members, does the committee agree to make no recommendations? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you very much. We no turn now to the second item uh, on our agenda this morning, which is an evidence session with representatives from NHS Orkney, uh, NHS Shetland and NHS Western Isles. Uh, this is part of our programme of scrutiny of NHS boards. Uh, so I'm pleased to welcome to the committee uh, Ian Kinnenborough, who is the chair of both NHS Orkney and NHS Shetland, Jerry O'Brien, the interim chief executive uh, of NHS Orkney, Ralph Roberts, the chief executive of NHS Shetland, and Simon Booker Ingram, the director of community health and social care and IGB chief officer at NHS Shetland, uh, Neil Galbraith, chair of NHS West Niles, and Chris Ann Campbell, who is the Nurse Director and Chief Operating Officer of NHS Western Isles. Welcome uh, very much uh, to you all. Uh, can I start just um, for uh, clarification and certainty with, uh, to ask uh, Ian Kinneborough about the position relating to the uh, permanent position of Chief Executive at NHS Orkney. I, I know that you share a chair between the two boards of Orkney and Shetland, and it would be helpful to the committee if you could simply uh, comment on the current position and future plans. Uh, thank you very much, convener. The, the current position is that we are um, presently making arrangements to advertise for the permanent and substantive post of Chief Executive, um, and I would hope that those arrangements would be put in place fairly soon, um, and we would conclude that uh, to allow us to move forward with a a degree of um, certainty both for the board and potentially for um, the, the individuals concerned. Thank you very much. Uh, and can I turn to David Stewart to ask the first set of questions? Uh, good morning, and can I welcome you all today and I'd delight to see you all uh, along to have a discussion about your respective boards. I want to kick off talking about geographic challenges, which you'll all be experts on, and I'm sure that exercises you all day and daily. Clearly, from the political side, there's been some political devices historically that have helped, uh, the air discount scheme, uh, RET, for example, uh, structural funds, which have obviously been focused on GDP and, and population. And if you want wider examples of what other countries have done, the Japanese Islands Act of the 1950s was an early example of help for, for islands. Could you each of the boards describe how difficult the da daily challenge between providing services in-house 
and having to go to other board areas. And clearly, from a regional point of view, I've had constituents which I've raised with Western Isles uh, but issues with patient travel, which I'm happy to talk about to perhaps at a later stage. But if I could kick off, first of all, on geographic challenges, how you manage that in a day-to-day -day basis. Start maybe if that's okay. I mean, I think it's a really, it's obviously probably the most important question for us. Um, and I think one of the things for me around it is when we talk about uh, performance, very often uh, in the island context, we're talking about sustainability of services as opposed to relative performance, because very often you're either delivering a service, in which case you will be meeting the targets, or you're significantly challenged in delivering a service, and therefore you may then be significantly away from a performance target. Uh, it then plays out in a number of issues like recruitment um, and retention of staff, um, and obviously also then in patient pathways. So, and I, and I think the way I would um, categorise it is that as, as, a chef, as an island health board, we have to collaborate both internally within the islands and then particularly within the region and with ourselves, Grampian, who most of our patients off-island go to. Um, we've particularly in the last year, or a number of years I suppose, but in this year, last year made some success around it, is understanding how we can actually support more patients to come back um, to Shetland and, and manage the pathway so that as much of their care is being provided locally as possible. Western House? Western House perspective. It's maybe useful just to point out there's a vast difference in reality uh, amongst the islands because we have Orkney and Shetland in the north but the North East and the Western Isles by definition, not only in the North, but in the West. So our communications are with both the Northern region, but also in fact with Glasgow. Many of our Barra patients, for example, go straight to Glasgow rather than be brought up uh, to, to Stornoway. But we face the same internal challenges in all the islands. We're dealing with a string of islands in which we're trying to make sure the National Health Service is in fact giving a quality uh, output uh, to, no matter where the people live in the islands. But we face exactly, as you've already mentioned, sending people as we do and have to uh, to the mainland, whether it's to the north or to the, to the west, uh, we have to consider the costs that are involved. And it's not so much the cost of patient travel, it's the cost of escorts, which, if you mentioned the Western Isles, for example, this is, in fact, a matter of debate at the moment because we're now applying the existing policy and the existing rules as they should be applied, and that is producing, of course, a number of complaints. But uh, irrespective of, of that particular fact, any anybody who's under 16 will always have an escort. Other than that, we're moving as far as we can in the direction, I think, as, as Rafe has made the point, we try to provide more of the services in-house rather than sending to the mainland. Equally, telemedicine and telehealth are coming to our aid because we see no real reason why a recall to a consultant in Glasgow uh, for a 10-minute occasion cannot be handled, in fact, over either the phone, in fact, as the simple approach, or by telemedicine itself. So we're seeking, in fact, to make savings, particularly on patient transport, and I'm happy to talk about it in detail, but it's not about the patient, it's about the escorts. I, mean, I, I think, uh, without reiterating what Rafe has said, I think there's also the, the, the factor as well. It's a, it's a relationship with the Scottish mainland, but it's also the inter-island uh, relationship as well. Orkney has 18 inhabited islands, so we, we're continually facing that challenge of not only how do we provide services in our main, uh, what we call the mainland, the mainland uh, uh, of Orkney, through, principally through the Balfour Hospital and uh, five independent <coughs> GP practices, but across our range of isles, and it's how do we support... Uh, uh, the GPs on those isles, how do we support those, uh, uh, the populations who live on those islands as well, and how do we actively support those? Uh, so you've not only got the challenge then of, in our case, our principal link is with NHS Grampian down to Aberdeen, where we have uh, uh, good, uh, very good relationships with NHS Grampian, but we're often asking people to travel from North Ronaldsey or Westray, who actually have to, first of all, travel to Kirkwall before they then travel on to, to Aberdeen. Uh, and I think those particular challenges uh, across the all islands groups uh, uh, for the for the out of hours the dark hours uh, the dark hours of the day that's where we face the particular challenges in trying to provide those services uh, twenty four seven uh, and as Rafe has mentioned it's the recruitment and retention issues but when we have those skilled practitioners on island it's then keeping them skilled and not allowing the skills atrophy because of the volumes uh, so so we've got that continual challenge to to face as well. 
I think it's worth also just adding that the three islands are very different in the way that they, they're geographically uh, laid out. So uh, certainly from my experience when I first moved from Shetland to Orkney, I wondered why some of the solutions that we might have put in place previously in Shetland didn't appear to, to work so well in Orkney. And, it's, and it is because the communication links, the physical transport links in between the islands uh, vary and the Western Isles are different to Shetland and different again to Orkney. So we're all island boards, but we, we have our own in individual internal challenges, I think, around communication and transport. Well, that's very helpful. Could I just raise another issue as far as looking at the hardware uh, that's um, available across Scotland? By definition for costs, some hardware, such as PET scanners, um, positron emission tomography scanners, um, would only be used in much larger boards and that is understandable. You won't have the figures in, in your head, but could you perhaps write to the committee with the number of patients that go each year uh, to uh, th uh, the other mainland um, in terms of Glasgow, Aberdeen um, and Edinburgh, which has the ability to provide this scanning. My understanding is that it has much more uh, positive and protective images, which is very helpful in diagnoses, which clearly you would want. So uh, unless I'm badly informed, it's very difficult for your boards to provide this. It may be other types of scanners. I know from Western Isles, I've had some discussions you would like to provide. So I suppose that's the sort of known knowns. For very expensive equipment, there will always be a case you have to send patients on. There will be some cheaper equipment that you can provide, and presumably there will be the ability um, to speak kindly to other boards in a regional sense to make sure that consultants are visiting Western Isles, Orkney and Shetland rather than been based in Inverness and Aberdeen, but I've had some discussions with the other boards, so I'd be interested in your view on that. Can I just add to that in, in terms of there's a level of expertise that the staff need in order to, to use that equipment. Um, there's a level of maintenance as well that, that requires an amount of expertise. So I think um, whilst um, it would be nice to have, um, but that the equipment at the, the high quality end um, there's obviously a, a, a human angle to that in terms of being able to staff that and sustain it. Um, so in terms of low volume, again, a point that, that was already been made, you know, we would have to sustain that level of expertise in a staff group who may be performing very few scans of particular areas of the body, for instance, that need some expertise in how to position, et cetera, to get the best images. So um, that would be a, probably the key factor in terms of skills retention. Um, and skills decay uh, in order to operate that equipment in the first place. Yeah, um, we've been looking at uh, purchasing an MRI scanner mm -hmm. uh, because we established that we would save around £250,000 a year on patient travel alone. But when we actually looked into purchasing one, which is close to a million pounds, uh, what we would actually save would be less than if we just carried on sending patients to the mainland. So that's early figures at the moment. Yeah, just add a comment, if I can, Chairman. The, the point at issue is most of our hospitals you would classify as rural general hospitals, although the one in Stornoway is a, a rural general plus. It does a few more things than the normal hospital would do as a small one. So we've got the particular position that with the population size that we have in the islands, it simply wouldn't make economic sense, apart from the fact that it's, it's in one sense, leaving aside just how... A, expensive some equipment can be it's it's recruiting the workers who actually can understand the equipment understand the data that it's produced make the correct diagnosis and then have a decision which is an accurate one so we do rely we have service level agreements obviously with various authorities and we do depend on them we depend in glasgow for example on the golden jubilee frequently so we've got this particular position that while well, we've in fact for many years worked as a group of islands uh, together with the North for about 15 years now. In fact, we're now moving into a regional situation which is much more formal, but for, for which is no, we're no strangers to this way of working. So we've been dependent always as small boards to work with the larger boards, and they have, in all cases, been very supportive. I, just to, I mean, I, I'd absolutely agree, and it, uh, it, is, it is about making a judgment around the balance of quality access staffing on on some of these issues and as it is with all of our services the, the issue i was going to just pick up as, as an example though is that we we now have and I, I think orkney do as well have a visiting dexa scanner that comes up in a, a mobile van um, a couple of times a year so there are 
potentially different solutions in some types of hardware. Um, we, we have looked at that for MRI and, and we don't think it's practical just because of the practicalities of shipping an MRI uh, scanner um, in the way that you have mobile MRIs going to some other places. But there are different solutions in different technologies depending on the exact detail of them. Okay. Can, I, uh, can I move on to the more thorny subject of funding? Um, as you know, the National Resource Allocation Committee, the NRAC formula, takes rurality into account. And, um, I was looking at the uh, Audit Scotland report, I think, for 2017, and I could see the variations as far as the various island boards are concerned. Does that formula work for you? Can I can I come in and make? <laughs> I thought that would get some interest. <laughs> um, so I so I w I would say yes and no. Uh, so I think it um, it generally seeks to address um, the situation in the islands, but there is something I think about the small scale of our boards um, and the fixed costs associated with the establishment and, and operation of the boards um, that that creates a little bit of a an additional pressure and I think the extreme rurality um, is perhaps something where there is still potentially a, a case to be made so in Orkney's example I think um, we successfully made a case for additional costs associated with a particular model in primary care that was being operated. I think there is the potential for a similar but not identical case to be made around the, the model that's uh, applied in Shetland. And these are, if you like, the subtle differences that aren't fully taken into account by, by NRAC. Um, but having said that, I think it, it is entirely, I think, up to us to uh, make that case and, and to see if we can get uh, support for that. There is not actually very much of a problem with NRAC. It's a very fair way, I think, of distributing money. Unfortunately, it starts from a quantum, and therefore, if the quantum has to be divided up to suit all the, the various boards, then you end up always with the fact that uh, there is insufficient money for the particular year. Therefore, we have to carry out in our case, for example, this year, £3 million worth of savings to make sure that we come in and budget. Now, we have successfully managed to do this for 10 years in a row, and I would uh, expect that we will yet again attempt to come in on budget. But it is a challenge at all times. There is a constant, almost weekly, check on how budgets are actually functioning. In fact, I know for certain that my own acting director of finance has, has quarterly, quarter of an hour systems running in which constant reports are pouring in explaining exactly where we are in terms of finance. So in terms of NRAC, one can't fault the actual formula, but the quantum that it's working with, uh, we would not object to seeing it increased. Do you want to add? Thank you, yeah, yeah. Um, just trying to think. Three, three years ago, when I was the director of finance uh, of NHS Orkney, uh, I worked very closely with the NRAC technical group in, the, in, in looking at the constituent elements of, of the NRAC formula, uh, and we successfully made an argument to subdivide the remote and rurality aspect of the NRAC formula into what we might call e the even more remote uh, data zones, that, uh, and we used as a proxy for that those entitled to the district, uh, the distant isles allowance, because we, we would strongly make the argument that the isles, again, are different even from the more remote and rural as areas of Scotland, uh, Scottish mainland, uh, and, and all all three of the, the, the island boards uh, at that point then uh, picked up well on the NRAC formula. I think Ian makes a very valid point. And, and to be very fair, this has been discussed extensively at the technical committee. There is a certain level of de minimis cost, which if, you, if you're to be a, an effectively functioning health board, you must have, uh, whether that to be support a, any pillars of, of the governance work. But I think uh, picking up Ian's point, I think we've, we've got to NRAC where it, where it reflects uh, the remote and rural, rural nature of the boards. It reflects that we're island boards uh, so I don't think we, 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 we could sit here and, and disagree with, with the formula uh, as it stands today. Final uh, question at this stage. Um, clearly, our islands, our future is very, very important. Um, all parties have been discussing what more work we can do to support islands. And a couple of years ago in COSLA, I met the three previous conveners of the respective local authorities, who I think have all uh, moved on since then. And they were very keen on a single public service operator in each of uh, the islands. 
um, which at one level will give you more scale, it won't perhaps give you more health muscle, but it will give you more perhaps synergies in finance and other issues. What, what's, do you, each of your board, health boards have uh, a position on that concept? Could it, I think we're all at various stages. For example, I think you'd be well aware most of the discussions on single, in, single island authorities uh, have taken place in local government contexts. There has been no involvement, no discussion with any of the health boards prior to any decisions being made. What we have at the moment in the Western Isles is a production of a report by the Western Isles Council in which it puts forward a number of possible options for the future, one of which, in fact, is to, to dispense not only with the IGBs but also with the health boards and to run the system as just a subset of the, of the council which, as you can see from one angle, makes a degree of sense. The key point will always have to be uh, certainly useful if we can achieve savings out of any kind of move, but it has to guarantee patient safety. It has to make sure that the quality uh, will not be diminished in any particular way. So our board has not yet met uh, to discuss the, the Council's proposition because part and parcel of what uh, the programme for government included was that uh, the Scottish Government would consider any proposal coming forward. But that proposal coming forward rests entirely with the Council to promote. And it has to do that within a set of caveats, one of which is that it has to, of course, involve uh, the people who have an interest. So from the point of view of the Western Isles, we'd hope that at some point the Council would, in fact, actually consult us. Could I, could I come in with a slightly <coughs> different perspective? So. Um, the, the programme for government clearly gave local authorities the opportunity to explore a single public authority um, and it set out a, a set of caveats that would need to be um, adhered to if, if we were to successfully uh, take that proposition forward. And I think it's fair to say that the um, approach by the, the three island councils has been different. Um, so in Orkney, the Islands Council is proactively pursuing that agenda uh, and we are in discussions with them but very much mindful that we need to demonstrate benefits to the community that we need to protect the staff and the NHS and we need to be able to demonstrate improved outcomes. Um, in Shetland the council have yet to really form a position on that so, so therefore the, the discussion with the board is in, in an entirely different place and clearly in the Western Isles there is, a, there is another approach being taken by the local authority. So I think it's, it's quite a mixed bag at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo what people would say. And, and for me, it's about doing this together and working through what the potential implications were and really focusing on will it make a difference to the outcomes we're delivering for the population in the community. It's not a, a theoretical thing to do around, you know, is it a good thing to have a single organisation? It's about what does that actually mean in terms of outcomes? And I think, for me, we would need to do that, understand what the benefits were and understand what the risks were and be very clear that within an island context, accepting that we are intimately integrated within the community and from the point of view of uh, integration and our primary and community services, they are very closely linked with council services and others. Our acute services are as much linked into mainland services and so anything we do on the islands has got to recognise that we work both ways mm. uh, and I think our clinicians would take different views depending on where they sit as to how they would see that um, and I think the other thing we, we need to be very mindful of is w one of our biggest challenges is recruitment and understanding what potentially us being seen to be outside the NHS or a different type of structure, what that might mean for recruitment of staff coming out off from the mainland into Shetland and what that might mean in terms of long-term careers. I have, have no doubt there are ways of managing that, but I think we, we have to be very careful that we get that right because otherwise we could, we could have unforeseen um, consequences. Yeah. So I think it's, a, it's an issue that we absolutely need to explore and understand where the benefits come, but also be very aware of what the potential implications are. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kate Forbes. I'd like to ask about the skills mix. How do you ensure that, that you have the right skills mix um, in terms of generalists, specialists, so that 
as many people as possible are, are treated uh, locally and in communities, uh, including uh, um, out-of-hours care. Who would like to oh, um, we, we, in the, in the out of hours, we have community and scheduled care nurses, and they are trained to almost advanced nurse practitioner level. We'll be taking them forward through the NP funding that's coming for training um, later this year as well. Within the hospital itself, we've now moved to a model where there are no actual doctors within the, the main hospital itself. Uh, and that's run by clinical support nurses who are advanced nurse practitioners. And what we found since we reduced the, the junior doctors on night shift is actually that the calls going out to consultants have reduced. So in, in terms of maintaining skills within the hospital at night, uh, I would say we're quite well advanced with that. During the day, we've also made quite a lot of progress in terms of our acute assessment unit and the nursing staff in there not having to rely completely on uh, consultant staff or uh, junior medical staff either. Within a &E, we've got um, extended school practitioners and they are all advanced nurse practitioners as well. But we bring them through uh, from band five at general level uh, through band six into band seven. So we develop them over a period of five years. So we do have some succession planning in place. it in a slightly different way I mean this is a constantly evolving picture so you know we're having to, to often peel back the layers in terms of what do we actually need to, to meet need what, what are the core components that, that we need to deliver that, that the particular functions that we need to to make sure that people are, are safe and looked after and it's of high quality so I think um, what Chris Hen has described is absolutely right is that constant look at um, what, what do we actually need to deliver this service and, and who else can deliver as well? Um, what are the particular skill sets? Because the traditional way of delivering services is not sustainable. Um, so talking from a Shetland perspective for a moment, we've got particular um, pressures around um, recruiting uh, general practitioners, and we have had for, for some time. Um, and whilst that seems to be easing a bit, we've been looking at, so what else can we, can we put in place to meet need? very successful model around advanced nurse practitioners, for instance. But I think that the, um, the opportunities that come around um, health and social care integration as well uh, are a key component of this. Um, and not just about statutory service providers, so what else can the third sector provide that might have traditionally been provided by um, statutory services? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's about a root and branch look uh, what we actually need, what are the core components to, to meet need uh, across a community at, at that level. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 would, I would agree 100% with what Chris Ann and, uh, and Simon have said there. And I think fundamentally we all start from the same place. It's an assessment of the staffing levels and the staffing mix that we need to meet our particular circumstances, whether that be in our acute services or mental health services or out of hours services. I think then we have to add the dimension going back to the geographical challenge of, particularly when it comes to the more specialist posts in terms of patients that we may well have to transport off island using the Scott Star service. So we have might have a we might have need I mean, there's often this uh, fallacy that says, well the island's all the sickest people are taken off the island. It says, well, that's true, but that's eventually. We can often be looking after the very ill people on the island, need to stabilise them, need to intubate them for maybe 12, 14 hours while we're waiting in the helicopter or the fixed wing uh, uh, to get on island in the, in the retrieval service to take those patients away. So we, do, we certainly have need for that. So we, when we're certainly looking, when we're certainly looking at our consultant medical staff, we're, we're looking for that broad range of experience. We, we really need we really need that that specialist generalist which is which has been which has been developed now so we're certainly looking for that odd animal that can deal with all ages so they can deal with children they can deal with adults they can provide to that we're really looking for people who probably can remain calm in the, in the emergency uh, it's very interesting I've got a good friend who's actually up with us at the moment is an anesthetist who I used to work with in the borders 20 years ago and he's a very very experienced anaesthetist and even he said the first time he stood there waiting in the ambulance to come through the, the door he says I didn't know what was turning up no and I, I, I couldn't just dial whatever number and phone the orthopedic surgeon phone the pediatric phone the pediatrician phone the so the, the, there's these dimensions we have we have to think about but I think 
the basics is that we, we start in the same position as all our territorial board colleagues in terms of an assessment of our need, and then we try and put the island dimension on that. Slightly different, I think, when you then get into the, the aisles where we might have GPs or advanced nurse practitioners on there, we were probably looking to upskill them in terms of basics or advanced life support, and they, those are probably minimum requirements, because very often what we're, what we're staffing up there for is, is, is not the, the in-hours primary care activity, which you might see. Uh, it's actually that emergency that might happen out of hours where they need to be very competent to deal with that. Uh, and with all of that brings the, the, the challenges of the recruitment, retention, and skills atrophy, which we've spoken about. Entries. The first is, so in terms of um, trying to treat people um, as locally as possible, albeit with the need to sometimes transport off the island, that is um, your concern or focus at the moment, is it? And secondly, looking to the future, both in terms of demographic challenges, um, ageing population, and also in light of Brexit and a reliance on uh, European uh, nationals as healthcare professionals, how are you preparing for both the demographic challenges and the potential impact on the workforce? Three right. small questions. Yeah. We go in reverse order this time. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think those, those, are, those are two significant challenges. I, I, think, I think the demographics, uh, and, and, and it's the demographics from, from both perspectives, it's the ageing population of which we serve uh, and, and the challenges that, uh, that that will bring in terms of the, uh, the, the multiple comorbidities, which we already uh, see lots of and everything that comes along with that. But we've, in line with that, we, we've also got an ageing workforce. We've got about... 32, 33% of our workforce, which are aged over 50, about 20% of them within the next two years could, if they chose to do so, exercise their option to retire. So we've, we've got that. We've, so, so we're always mindful of that in terms of our workforce plan and what are the skills that we need. And we, we know on island at the moment, we've got particular challenges around old age psychiatry, but we would actually like to, to move into the market of actually uh, uh, engaging our own old age psychiatrists because we might not perhaps uh, have 100% need today, but we will have in three, four, five years' time, and we're always mindful of the, the recruitment timeline that that might take. Brexit, we, we, again, we're, we're always uh, mindful of. Uh, we're not seeing directly on Orkney at the moment a, a direct correlation with the Brexit decision uh, and whatever that may bring in that, but it's undoubtedly when I speak to colleagues in the territory boards, particularly through the medical education field, we'll see that that may well be, uh, may well be impacting on uh, the, the number of uh, trainees uh, coming coming through the system. What we are doing at the moment, we've got a big push on at the moment, we have had for the last couple of years. We we're really pushing quite hard through our Director of uh, Medical Education, who we share with NHS Highland, uh, is to encourage the undergraduate levels to come on to Orkney, and they're coming on to Orkney and they're having a great time, uh, both professionally and personally, and they're really enjoying it. We're getting really positive feedback on that, in the hope that we'll get some of them to come back, and therefore when they're, when they're qualified, uh, because we, we do recognise in, in some of our areas where we attract people probably at either end of their career, those, that, uh, those, those just kicking off, or those maybe who've, who've had a very active career and are now coming to look to, uh, to pass on some of that professional skills. So we take all these uh, factors into account. But in terms of uh, demographics, they are definitely prime in our thinking at the moment, as I say, both for our, our population, but also our workforce. Uh, but Brexit, we're not probably seeing the impact that some of my territorial board colleagues are, are definitely seeing at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, Neil Galbraith. Yeah. Chairman, to, to emphasise the bit about the demographics, the Western Isles is actually in the worst position of the lot on the basis that we have proportionately a much more aged and ageing population, allied to the fact that we have the lowest proportion of youngsters uh, entering employment, so we've been hit by a double whammy in the future, in so far as we we look towards it. But we've we've tried, uh, in collaboration with the University of the Highlands and Islands, to promote a number of courses, and indeed uh, the university needs no encouragement to to find other courses. It's actually taken over nurse education. We have a provision in the Western Isles. Equally, we're now represented at careers conventions in schools, just to make it clear that uh, there's more jobs in the, in, the, in the health service than simply uh, the ones that appear. For example, I work with volunteers quite a bit, and we have a fair number of youngsters from schools that will actually quite happily uh, volunteer to come to the hospitals to do a bit of, bit of support work. Uh, I have to be honest and say that the girls themselves almost always graduate towards the maternity ward, 
as their main interest uh, in that kind of volunteering. But it's that kind of involvement which we would hope sparks an interest and for people to realise that there's a huge range of jobs available in the health service. As far as Brexit's concerned, we've pr pretty much the same bit. We have, in fact, I think seven of our consultants are, are Polish, so therefore we have to be concerned that, uh, depending on the Brexit decision, whether or not that they stay and what the arrangements will be. But like everybody else, we'll have to be fleet of foot insofar as we can when it gets to that stage. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a risk that, that we need to assess quite closely because four of our anaesthetists are all Polish. So if they all left at the one time, we would be in significant trouble. Yeah. Robert. Yeah, if I start with the Brexit issue first, and I think that point is, is, is really well made about the, na me the mix of our uh, consultant staff. Um, and I think it reflects over time the fact that the UK hasn't trained doctors to work in rural areas. And, and if we looked at uh, where we would recruit from, there are people from elsewhere in the world who are probably better, a better fit because of the breadth of their training. Uh, so we've just been out uh, for some, some anaesthetic posts and we've had locum uh, anaesthetic consultants who, who work in India and they've got a very broad skill set so they fit quite well. Um, so I think one of our responsibilities as a board is to try and encourage and um, ensure that as a system we look at that better within, in, within the UK and certainly we've just been part of the recent GMC visit to Scotland and that was one of the points we were making to the GMC around the way they develop their training in the future is that we need to get that breadth right because there are very small place, places like the islands where we have a particular uh, niche. Um, so so that's, that's really important. And then the other bit I think is this thing about the pipeline and, and I think it is about encouraging our own uh, population to look at careers in health. We know all the evidence from across the world is that if you come from a rural area, you're much more likely to go back and work in a rural area. Um, so we have been pushing quite hard. Um, you know, the um, Within the uh, access to medical schools, there's been quite a lot of work around uh, kids from deprived areas having support to get into medical school medical school quite rightly but I would certainly look for that to be rolled out into rural areas because I think that would be very beneficial. And the only other point I would make about demographics is for me that is actually where community planning comes in. It's about how do we work with our community planning partners to, to improve the or ensure that the um, population mix in the islands is as vibrant as it can be, as economically active as it can be and that's certainly one of the main priorities within the Shetland community plan is how do we make sure that mix of the population is right. Thank you. Just one small quick point to, to <coughs> add to that. Uh, we shouldn't forget as well this applies to social care. So, you know, that, that underpins an awful lot of the care in the community and without that, that would swamp uh, the NHS. And so in terms of um, ageing population, but ageing workforce, depopulation of some of our more remote areas within Shetland uh, is, is clearly impacting as well. Uh, and that's making it really, really difficult around recruitment and retention for, for those staff that are so integral to, to keeping people in the community. Just one last point in terms of collaboration between yourselves and the NHS Highland when it comes to trying to recruit um, professionals who've had experience of rural and have the right skill set. I note last week the Scottish Government um, pilot programme around midwifery. Um, the sort of, now, that's a great example. What other examples are there, or what would you like to see in terms of concrete examples working with, the, with UHI for ensuring, or working with the colleges for ensuring that um, there are trainees who have the right mix for what you need? Or one of our other services that's severely challenged, that's maintaining laboratory services. And I would like to see UHI in particular uh, taking up uh, some, some course work around uh, supporting that service. So at the moment, uh, we're starting to take on MLA's uh, lab assistants who will actually progress on to becoming biomedical scientists. And one is actually attending Ulster University. So we would like to see uh, UHI offering some of the courses that, that Ulster do at the moment, because of course the, the travel is significant four times a year, but we're supporting her to progress through that. So anything at all through lab shared services that could be provided as a means of, of supporting uh, the local workforce in that way would be excellent. 
Chairman, sorry, if I can just add maybe one little bit. In the past, in education, the colleges used to make a specific provision to take students from the islands, a guarantee, in fact, of entry, obviously, as long as they met the, the necessary qualifications to be admitted. So a system like that that would guarantee entry for those that met the qualification levels living the islands uh, would help us greatly. And, for example, we have two of our doctors at the moment who are actually born, bred, raised in the Western Isles who have come back to actually work there. So it's the proof that if you can, if you accustom people, it doesn't come as a culture shock when you move from the city and the mainland if you've come from a rural background. Frequently, we can recruit quite successfully, but we can't retain because after two years of the winds that blow in all the islands, uh, people realise the day they came and the sun was shining is not the norm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you, and good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. I'd like to focus on general practice and particularly the response of your uh, practices locally to the GP contract. Um, largely, that's been received pretty well across the country, although the members of this committee have been effectively lobbied, uh, very effectively lobbied by rural GPs and groups representing rural GPs who have concerns about the contract and particularly what might happen in phase two in three years' time. Given the remoteness of your boards and the particular rural needs of your boards that that the risk for that might be particularly acute for each of your um, the, the areas you represent can you tell us how that contract has been received to your knowledge locally and what kind of work you're doing with the GPS to sort of influence the next phase of that I think it's very helpful the way the questions actually been posed because the concern is not so much about phase one as implemented it's the prospects for phase two when what appears to be the case is that if you're in the rural areas, you're liable to be paid less than would be the case if you're in the central area, as, for example, payment may move towards numbers. Now, there's a rationale for that, and I would accept that. Second bit, just not to miss the point, is that one of the parts of phase two is that the, the health boards take over responsibility for all premises, and that has a financial uh, cost that we, we would want to certainly make sure was was included. However, to go back to the basic point of the question, I think there's a general acceptance at the moment because of the guarantee that nobody is losing any money, that there, are, there is a, a widespread acceptance that on balance it's a, a better deal than has been the case. But prospectively, there's no guarantee that that will come out in phase two. And because of that, there is concern. So there is acceptance, but concern. Robert. I think it's a really, the way, as Neil said, the way the question's uh, been phrased around what the impact is in phase two, for me, is the most important bit, because in reality, in Shetland, um, other than perception, it makes, it'll make very little difference. Most of our practices will be protected in terms of income, um, and assuming that doesn't lead to people moving because they think there's somewhere else which is getting additional money, and, and that plays out, which we don't yet know, um, then there shouldn't be... A, a, a big impact in phase one, but I think the way phase two plays out is going to be is the really really important bit, and we need to make sure we, we influence that appropriately. Um, the other bit to say from a Shetland perspective, obviously, is uh, two of our practices are um, independently provided; the rest are provided as a salaried set of salaried practices. So, from that point of view, the contract doesn't have the same direct implication. Um, I think. Broadly, you would say that there's difference of opinions within. Some of the practices have been quite um, exercised about the potential impact of the contract, um, and others think a lot of the um, underlying um, messages in the contract about the development of multidisciplinary teams, focusing the role of the GP, having other members of the team doing other aspects is absolutely the way primary care should go. And the challenge for us is how do you actually then play that out? And that's the work we should be doing linked into the memorandum, memorandum of understanding around a primary care improvement plan, sitting down with our GPs and saying, right, what does this really mean? How, do we gonna, how are we going to do this? And recognising that even in somewhere like Shetland, our practices are different. So we've got a practice in Lowick, which is sort of 7,000 people and is very like a r rural practice in any Scottish town of the same size as Lowick. The fact that it's on an island doesn't make much difference at that level, down to practices with 500 population. and they're, So they're completely different as well. So w part of our job is to make sure that we apply that appropriately within the Shetland, con within the Shetland context.
uh, Ian and then if, if I could just add, I, th I think it's really important that we engage with primary care, with, with all our GPs, and encourage them to, to, to actively be involved in the discussions and negotiations leading up to uh, the implementation of phase two, because a lot of the issues at the moment are probably due to either lack of information or misinformation. So making that work more effectively, I think, might help us to eye in some of the, the potential pitfalls out of the, uh, out of the contract as it evolves. Th there is another point, however, that I would like to um, bring to your attention around this. And, and I guess it applies to everything around remuneration. Um, but it's, it's a point that we've made with the, with the team working on, on GP contract. And that's the impact of um, the, the, the minimum in income standard study, um, which, which clearly demonstrates that the cost of living uh, in remote and rural Scotland is significantly different to the cost on cent particularly the central belt. Um, and, and in fact, in very remote parts of the islands, it can be 140%. Uh, so when we start talking about national contracts and national remuneration, the pound doesn't go as far. So we, we are, we are the, the, the individuals are, are possibly indirectly penalised, I think, because the cost of living in these remote locations is significantly higher. In, in, the, light of, thank you for that. in, in the light of everything that you've all said, um, is there a concern about recruitment, given the fact that there is an element of uncertainty about what phase two will look like? And to that end, would you welcome clarity and certainty sooner rather than later? And will you be actively lobbying the process uh, around phase two? If I maybe start, um, I mean, absolutely lobbying, and I have um, got been asked to sit on the short life working group around rural implementation of the primary care tron contract and I'm really pleased to be part of that so that's certainly somewhere where we'll be looking at how, how will this play out within the rural area. Um, I mean I think the recruitment issue we absolutely are continually uh, focused on. We've made some progress this year, we, at the beginning of the year we had about 20% of our GP uh, posts vacant. Um, it has got slightly better but the area that we are still finding very difficult are the very small practices where we're asking people to work 24 7 uh, for long periods of time um, and that will continue I think to be an issue and I, th I think that for me is one of the aspects within phase two that we need to understand which is that the the feedback we would get from um, GPs is that the formula and the way that's played out in phase one around workload hasn't properly recognise the complexity of the job as a GP in a remote and rural area and often that isn't about individual patients coming through the door it's the complexity of that it's your ability to have colleagues immediately on site it's the fact you've got to provide emergency services so for me one of the aspects within phase two as we as that develops is how do we actually properly recognise what the workload of a rural GP is. Yeah. I think, I think that's 100% uh, the key point. Just for a bit of context, Orkney has got six GP practices, uh, five of which are independent uh, on the on the Orkney mainland, and we've got a sixth uh, board administered, which covers our, our outer isles. Uh, uh, and I think I would describe it as that there is definitely an acceptance of the contract, and I, and I think acceptance is the correct word rather than embracing of the contract. Uh, but certainly what our, our, our ambition and our aim through our... Uh, implementation plan is actually to work through that is is how do we define uh, that role responsibility or of a remote and rural GP and because because the expectations of them requirements of them are different and they're even different across different parts of the island so our, our two practices which are based in Kirkwall actually from this time next year will be physically based within the new hospital facility so it gives them ready access to uh, facilities which perhaps 11 12 miles away in the west or the east of the mainland you don't have and then again our, our, our board administered practice which covers the outer isles they might even have a ferry and then a bus journey to, to get a, a, a worst case scenario a ferry and then an ambulance journey uh, to get to get into the hospital so so to me it's very much about that uh, how do we develop that role of the GP and that's something we are definitely looking to do together I, I don't think there's any other way we can do it uh, I'm, ve I'm very keen uh, and I've said to my GP colleagues to have a, a very active 
the conversation uh, with my, 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 my GP colleagues and it's how we develop those services uh, because obviously we've got a new facility coming online in Kirkwall as well. We're looking to get the maximum use out of that. We're, the premises is not really so much of an issue for us because we already, the health board already own all the premises uh, which the, the, the practices uh, operate out of. But it's, we're looking to, to extract every advantage we can out of the, 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 the new contract. We're probably in a similar situation. Uh, we, we don't foresee at the moment uh, GPs leaving because there might be this perception of there's more money to be earned south. I think uh, our, our GPs certainly make that lifestyle choice as well as most people who do who move to the to the islands uh, as well as we have some, uh, just picking up a point made, we have some Arcadians who have now come back onto the island's GPs. The recruitment issue, what I'm certainly seeing, is struggling more to recruit at partner level. Uh, they're not looking to take on the responsibilities of being the partner and maybe more happy to be a salaried GP with an in in independent practice. And we're, we're seeing that little that little shift there, which is putting more of that management senior partner burden onto maybe one or two key individuals. Well, of course, are we concerned? And the answer is yes, we are concerned. It's difficult, as you would well understand, to recruit, but it's just as difficult to retain where there may be the decision after two or three years that this is not the lifestyle, in fact, that they have built it for. You know, that working four days a week and suffering for two days a week is not, in fact, what they had planned. So we are concerned. And it, I mean, it's part of a, a much more general concern. Uh, for, for example, you know, the plans about setting up centres of excellence. The very nature of those would appear to be that's a very attractive <coughs> proposition for doctors and cult consultants. And if we run the risk of losing people... Uh, then that will certainly happen. But we have to make the efforts as we do to make sure that there is a sort of welcome uh, to a new recruit. For example, you normally, especially with, let's say, the sort of more elderly but not completely old uh, consultants you may recruit, you're not recruiting just the one doctor, for example, you're recruiting a family. And therefore, the provision has to be there in terms of the socio-economic background that provides for the possibility that a spouse will want to work or the possibility that children's education can be promoted. So it's, it's a, a long way of going around the circle to say that the close work we have with the council actually matter here, quite importantly, because they have the same concern, they have the same problems in recruitment and the same problems in retention. So collaboration on that, I think, is extremely important. But our concern won't go away. It will ease to some degree once we're certain about Brexit and we can then actually focus on what is possible within the political framework that we operate. Ian Canberra. So I guess I'm an, an eternal optimist. Um, and I, I see this as a real opportunity, um, potentially to engage with GPs in a different way um, and to construct something that looks different for them as well. And, and in that sense, if we're successful in doing that, then hopefully that will make jobs more attractive and will give us an opportunity to, uh, I think, compete. Putting the GPs at the heart of what we do, working in localities, doing things in a different way, I think could be an exciting opportunity. And I think we need to engage with the, with the GPs and with people coming through training just to highlight where the opportunities arise and then how, how much better potentially the job could be for them uh, than it is at the present time. A brief further point on this from Yeah, in fact, but I sh probably should mention, uh, I also have the pleasure of chairing the Scottish Rural Medicine Collaborative that supports some of this work. And I, very briefly, I think the three areas we're particularly focused on is one, how do you market or make change the mood music around working as a rural GP because I think they, are, they can be brilliant jobs so we need to change the mood music, music about that. Secondly, how do we make the recruitment process as good as possible uh, and within that I think very much focusing, obviously we've got huge opportunities around our locality but actually in most cases it's about the job so how do we make sure people are focused on what the job is um, and then and thirdly how do we make sure we provide people who work in relatively remote areas uh, supported and have networks of support so that they don't get isolated and improve retention. Thank you very much. Now telemedicine was mentioned uh, in answer to one of the early questions and I'd like to bring in Emma Harper. Thanks Kavina. good morning everybody. You talked about the geographical challenges and mentioned telemedicine already and last week we heard from Greater Glasgow how they're doing orthopaedic clinics uh, using remote uh, access. So I'm aware there's an Empower programme which is part of Dufries and Galloway, Ayrshire and Arran and Western Isles 
it, to look at keeping people in their homes longer. So that's really important where we've got health and social care challenges. So it's not just about acute care, it's about keeping people in their homes longer. So I'd be interested to hear about Empower because it's interreg EU money funded. So is that money safe post Brexit? Because that's a challenge. But and other, um, how do you measure whether telemedicine is effective and do patients like it? Yes, please. And then I'll, I'll ask Chris Ann to rescue me from the answer, <laughs> which is basically to say that in terms of the of the of the programme itself. Uh, we're working to try to make sure that we, first of all, repatriate as many of the services that we can reasonably do and operate. For example, orthopaedics, until about five, six years ago, uh, most of our orthopaedic cases had to go to the mainland. We now operate in the Western Isles and to the stage now that uh, the orthopaedics, which was largely, of course, hips and, and knees, uh, has now extended to wrists as well. So we're able locally to make that provision, but because of the advance of technology, we're able to link up to specialists in other areas who can who can follow quite specifically and indeed give advice if, if they're asked for it. So if I can divert just to the answer about the money, as far as we understand it, because of the transition period, however it's described, the money continues to flow till that point. What happens after that is, of course, up to the government as to how it wishes to, to see these going. But, I mean, just to emphasise the point, the islands and the remote areas in the sense of the mainland are actually obliged by necessity to come, come up with solutions which are driven by technology, which eventually will be what the other boards will do as well. So the collaboration that's going on at the moment through tel tel uh, healthcare is quite extensive. For example, we've got uh, a new instrument that uh, basically will replace the stethoscope in which the person can not only sound a chest, for example, but can actually see inside the heart. Now that itself can be streamed on the internet to specialists elsewhere who can advise on that kind of approach. So there's a huge opening in terms of the positive nature of uh, the internet that we can work and take some of the good bits out of it. So, Kirsten, do you want to add to yeah, that? I, I suppose, I mean, we, we, we have patients with long-term conditions, cardiac failure, COPD, diabetes, and so on, who are being mo monitored from home uh, using Florence. So they, they, they can uh, input all their own information, their blood sugar levels, and so on, on a daily basis. Uh, and and if, if they're um, at risk of uh, deteriorating, for example, a cardiac failure nurse will communicate with them immediately and can attend them in the home rather than bringing them into hospital. So it's almost like early warning systems are in place for those patients, and, and these seem to work very well. Um, more recently, we've introduced, um, within the hospital itself, a, a mobile echo scanner, and now our echo sonographer can actually view the images remotely uh, and when she's not there, provide advice uh, so that that patient can actually be transferred early to Glasgow or treated uh, locally. So there's several things, really, I suppose, that are in progress at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Just to continue the theme very briefly about uh, acute services, um, but I, w I don't want to major on that. I mean, we've been doing um, ENT clinics, for instance, from Shetland, um, linking in with the mainland um, through technology for, for a number of years. We're starting to use the Attend Anywhere uh, system of outpatient appointments um, being carried out uh, remotely, uh, and that's working well. But these are early days and early steps for some of these. They also rely on clearly people at the, the other end, if it's on the mainland, uh, playing into this as well to support Shetland with um, the, these, uh, these initiatives. Um, if I can just touch on the community aspects, at the moment in Shetland, we've got over 600 pieces of uh, technology-enabled care equipment out in the community that is helping to support people to stay safe uh, and be cared for in their own homes. One of the, the huge limiting factors for us in terms of doing more that links people's own homes, either to a hub in Shetland or to the um, Scottish mainland, is the availability of broadband width that's adequate to support these pieces of technology. 
And, and for us, that is a, a, a huge limiting factor. There is a lot more that we can do that we want to do. We can see the opportunities. But we're being hampered at the moment by um, the, the poor broadband width that exists in many places in, in Shetland and, and some of the, the, the most difficult places to use any kind of technology-enabled care are our most remote and rural places, which are the very uh, communities that, that we could use this technology to support people better and provide a better quality of life for those individuals and particularly to take out the travel. So um, I think we're, we're probably, having heard from, from the Western Isles, we're, we're a slightly different place uh, in terms of things that we're trialling and, and using. But, I mean, suffice to say, we're trying to be really innovative um, I think there's a lot of tests of change going on at the moment uh, in various places in, in Scotland, and I, th I think that's fine. I obviously welcome the new digital strategy that will give us a, a common platform because, again, that's really important. We've got a myriad of systems out there, and it's, it's in terms of the technology, um, we need systems to be able to talk to each other and share information because that's a key component of being able to provide integrated care across health and, and social care. And at the moment, we don't have some of the platforms available to allow that as well. So I think that there are solutions on the horizon, but we're going to need them really quickly. Um, I think it's worth saying that, that, that clearly telemedicine, telehealth um, is, a, is a real positive for patients and for patient experience. But it's also a good way of, of unlocking realistic savings, which we can then start to think about reinvesting in, in expanding that work. Um, I think in Shetland in 2016, by memory, we had something like 600 avoided patient journeys uh, because we utilised telemedicine in the following year. I think that increased to 1,400. Um, so each of those journeys um, potentially would cost at least £300 purely in airfares. Uh, so it makes it makes a significant uh, financial um, incentive to to encourage island boards to work more effectively in in that way. But I think the points that have been made around the limiting factors of good communication, um, good good broadband, good phone links, uh, mobile connectivity, are things that that do limit us in a way from doing more of that, and and the culture. Uh, so getting people working on the mainland willing to change the way they work to support us in doing more of this um, is, is a, a barrier that we're working hard to overcome. We're making progress, but there's still more to do around that. I think Sandra White had a brief supplementary on the travel costs. Question. Well, basically, yes, and thank you very much for your evidence. It's been very educational to me coming from the mainland. The one I wanted to ask was about transport costs. I know Ian Braith had mentioned that in escorts. It's one that I sort of know about because obviously Glasgow, a uh, number of people come from islands to access and there's people who have relatives in my constituency who, you know, come to me to see about that. Really interesting what you said about the budget, uh, 600, you know, less of transport because of telemedicine and, and you know, being able to get broadband, etc. How much of an impact actually does transportation have on your budgets? Very negative or is it getting better for all everyone? It's got a massive effect on our, our systems. The, tra the Highlands and Islands transport system was originally funded centrally by the government. So to an extent, there was never any disincentive uh, to send patients and indeed to approve of every single escort. That money three years ago, if not four years ago, uh, was handed over to the local authorities to administer. Now, at the moment, uh, in the last financial year, we have spent over £3 million on transport costs, of which at least 46 to 48% of that is escorts. Now, in certain cases, without a doubt, escorts are necessary. In other cases, as I mentioned earlier, if it's a 10-minute follow-up meeting, it can be done by tele telephone. That's a simple thing uh, with a consultant, and it would actually then bring about savings. So, yes, we are keen to bring about savings, but I really have to emphasise it's because we're now applying the policy. We haven't invented anything new or introduced any new policy, but it hasn't stopped complaints beginning to mount. Yeah, just in relation to all about, we don't quite spend quite as much as the Western Isles. We're probably circa 2.4, 2.5 million through the Highlands and Islands travel scheme. Uh, we're probably organising about 
in total about six and a half thousand journeys a year of about seventeen hundred of those are for escort. So, so it's it, it's quite it's quite significant. Uh, and just going back to an earlier point, we and, and back uh, back to Mr. Stewart's point, we put a CT scanner on Ireland three and a half years ago, and we probably saved three hundred thousand pounds a year from travelling backwards and forwards to Grampian from that, and uh, just and we use the national pack system and national reporting system because uh, it's Grampian who read the CT scans. So uh, there is definitely an incentive in there for us to uh, to try and l limit the journeys and, and that they will result uh, in, a, in a, a saving to us as, we, as well as it being probably the best thing for the uh, the patient. Yeah, I mean, just in context. For us, uh, our budget is about 47 million and last year we spent about 2.7 million on patient travel. This year, I think it was going to be nearer 2.1, 2.2 once we've seen the final figures. Um, and that is partly because of the success we've had around treating more people locally um, and is partly because we were able to, to uh, negotiate a different deal with Logan Air. Um, I think one of the risks for us um, going forward is um, those of you who are aware of the um, air, air service issues in Scotland, we have had this year for the first time a uh, competition on the islands between Logan Air and Fly B that has stopped again. Um, so we are very dependent on a single provider who is obviously mm. a commercial provider um, so we will shortly be getting back into renegotiating with them uh, in uh, around uh, next year's prices and and so there is certainly a risk there f for us um, that we will have to try and manage but the focus I think has to be I mean obviously the financial aspect of this is important but ultimately we need to recognize that behind every single one of those pounds spent is a patient who's having to make a journey and in many cases an elderly patient with an elderly escort um, for a 10 minute appointment and it might take them 12 hours so I think we have to remember the, the patient behind mm -hmm. the, the statistics. If, if I could just um, go back to the very early point around the geographical differences between the three islands. And I suppose the, the successful negotiations with Logan Air around patient travel um, were partly predicated on the fact that in Shetland we did have a, a realistic opportunity to send all our patients by boat. Um, albeit that wouldn't have been particularly attractive and in fact the, the public let us know how unattractive that was as a proposition. But, but nevertheless, it, wa it was a real alternative, and I think it helped bring Logan Air to the negotiating table, and therefore we were able to get a preferential deal from them. That doesn't apply in an Orkney context, because we would need to have a daily boat going to Aberdeen, and in fact we don't. We have two a week going to Aberdeen, so it's less... We, in Orkney, we wouldn't be able to effectively put that um, th threat, shall we call it, on the table to Logan Air and, and potentially leave us. So we're, we're really trying to, I suppose, negotiate with Logan Air with a hand tied behind our back if we're trying to get the same kind of beneficial deal that we've managed to achieve in, in Shetland. So I think it's, it's, it's not that we don't want to share the good practice and, and to roll it out. It's just that the commercial reality makes it very challenging for us to do that. Any further points from Neil? I'll gloss on the earlier question about cost because I think it's a, a useful example of this. Uh, we moved from having one uh, consultant orthopaedics surgeon to having two. And the effect of that was immediate in the sense of the number of people we were able to deal with in the Western Isles. Huge saving at that point. What we hadn't reckoned, of course, was that with two of them working, is that in, they are extremely successful and extremely experienced that it began to cost us a small fortune in ceramics and steel <laughs> as they began to, to use this. In fact, we, we hadn't budgeted anything like sufficient money for that. So what we saved on patient transport was instantly swallowed up in, in more uh, making sure people were cared for and able to walk. Thank you very much. Ivan McKee. Uh, thanks, Convener. Good morning, panel. Very interesting um, evidence so far. Um, I'd like to follow up... Um, a bit on the kind of technology side and broaden that out a wee bit. And I know that there's um, issues around about financial challenges, I think, going to come up later. And 
some of your performance measures, although many of them are better than the Scottish average, which is which is good to see. And, and the area I want to kind of delve into a wee bit is to get a better understanding of the process whereby you go about process improvement. How do you identify opportunities for savings? How do you identify opportunities for performance improvement? How do you share best practice? How structured is that process? Or is it just kind of ad hoc and you hope that good ideas kind of make themselves apart? Or, or have you got a structured way of, of, of going about that and, and digging out the actions you need to take to continually improve performance? to kick off on that one. Uh, I, I think certainly the process improvement, whether that be cash or non-cash, has certainly become a lot more structured uh, for the entire service, but uh, certainly in Orkney over the last uh, couple of years. And, and, and I suppose going back to, to first principles, everything, everything starts with the data to try and identify the opportunities. And uh, and it's with all of these things, you, you, you usually start with those things as, uh, where am I an outlier? Where am I spending more than the average? Where am I spending more than I would perhaps like to? Where am I performing badly? And it's then using using the process. We've taken a lot of time uh, over the, the last couple of years to train lots of people in the specific skills rather than just randomly saying, well, because it's not always the case, as you'll know, that just because you're an outlier, you're, you're, effectively, you're, you, you, you're effectively bad. So it's about understanding the data, understanding it over time. So what we certainly do is we target areas, whether that, uh, and uh, so our, our clinical services are certainly driven by those areas where we are an outlier and it generates our improvement plans, whether they be in dermatology, whether they be in cardiology, whether they be in ophthalmology. We go through much the same process in relation to financially uh, driven efficiencies. Uh, I, I think the days we would all accept of the low hanging fruit are well, well, well gone. Uh, and, and it's one of the challenges I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll discuss uh, later in the committee in terms of how we identify those savings. So there's got to be a systematic review of the underlying data to tell us where we're going that. We, we've adopted a methodology within Altney of uh, strategy deployment matrices where uh, uh, each, each our ambition by the end of this year, and we're already a good little way along there, is every department will have its own improvement plan in place. Some of those already have those plans in place. Some of those by the end of this financial year will merely have identified the areas where they want to uh, improve, uh, improve upon. Uh, and as you might expect, the people who were keenest to be involved are those that are furthest, furthest ahead uh, at the moment. So we take a very, a, a very structured view to, view to that in terms of identifying the baseline, identifying the measure, the, 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 cha the changes we'd like to make, what are the expected changes we'd see coming out uh, of those. Uh, and, and lots of small scale tests of change. Um, we've applied that methodology into our infection control. We've applied it into a series of clinical services. Uh, so I would not like to sit here and say to anybody we're perfect, but I think we, we, we're trying to apply a, a structured approach to it. And I think there's also the bit about, about applying We've got limited resource to look at this, so uh, we, we, we try to target our experts in that. But what, what we're really trying to do is is very much a, a training approach. Uh, what we're finding is we get the best results when it's the staff themselves who come up with the ideas and generate uh, the ideas. They all then feed in through the organisational structures into our senior management team, our senior leadership team, which, which I chair, and ba basically covers all the direct reports to me, plus uh, various other heads of department and we pull that together on a monthly basis so so it's a it's, it's a fairly it's a fairly structured uh, approach rather than just saying let's let, let's go through it okay thanks um robert sir please thank you thank you convener um i mean i would echo everything jerry has said and i think um it is about using the data focusing across uh, the organization understanding where you think there are issues i th I, mean, I was just pick up on a, a number of sort of areas where i think um it's, it's unique in the islands. I think one is um, our ability to um, focus individual members of staff in the same way as some of the bigger boards do around improvement. So I think that is a challenge. Uh, so we've got a lot of staff who are dealing with a lot of different areas uh, because they have to be uh, to cover a whole range of areas. Um, I think we very much try and use national programmes as much as possible. I think sometimes we feel that our ability to do that is maybe disadvantage because it's harder to get down to improvement events and, and, and that face-to-face -face contact can be an issue uh, for us and sometimes it can be difficult just to release staff to go because you've got you know one or two members of staff in a team so so I think that's an area we, we, we continue to work on I think if you focus it around um, resources in particular I, I would 
suggest that a number of years ago we very much applied a we, we set targets across the organization and expected individual areas to, to deliver those. We tried to do that in a way that um, we focused where, so we, we had differential targets depending on how we wanted to shift resource in the organization. Increasingly, as we've, we've done that and areas have developed what they've done, we're now moving more to a sort of whole board approach and we've just been running a scenario planning process which has been trying to look at the whole organization, what's the future model of service, and that would then allow us to drive um, efficiencies out of individual areas rather than saying everywhere needs to now deliver because I think the the sort of easy to the, the low hanging fruit if you like people use that phrase has gone it's now about understanding what are the key areas of major redesign that we need to focus our efforts and resources on You'll go back. Well, I'm conscious there were a few sub questions there and I may not pick, pick them all up but uh, just to pick up the bit, bit about structure all of these executive directors every year have targets set for themselves. Uh, they involve themselves in these targets. All of them are aimed at improvement. They're all starting at the base of this is the situation as is, and this is what we hope to achieve by the end of the year. And at the end of that year, Chief Executive reviews all of that progress. Hopefully it's progress, and the Chief Executive is, of course, uh, reviewed by myself. So there's a structure there all the time. And because we're small boards, uh, the executive director at a meeting every week. In fact, we've now got an integrated management team with the council. So there's a beginning to be a sort of coalescence of aims and objectives, all aimed towards some form of, of improvement. I'm not suggesting it's all perfect and that indeed everybody succeeds to the extent that you might hope, but it is highly structured. Now, as I say, I'm conscious there were another couple of bits in your question. I wonder if you'd mind... Yeah, um, what was how you use that to tackle financial challenges, you tackle performance challenges, how you learn best practice from other, other boards as, as well, yeah. Okay, well, the North of Scotland Planning Group, uh, which consists of everybody in the North who's now part of the new regional organisation, has been in existence for 15 years. So we've been collaborating to a degree without the formality of the new system for a long time. In terms of the financial challenges, uh, we're all facing exactly the same prospect there. You've got rising demand. You have systems in which, uh, for example, if I look towards the future, we're assuming a 3% pay increase for everybody. We're assuming also that that will be included in the budgets, uh, that we've been able to pay for them. But equally, every year, we're required to carry out 2 to 3% savings. So there's a constant weekly focus on bringing about those savings. Some of them, as, a, as identified in advance, are not necessarily easy to achieve. And as the year progresses, you can begin to see that they were good suggestions at the time. But alternatives have now got to be sought. For example, you wouldn't be too surprised since December. We were working very carefully to make sure we put a break on as much as we could because we were in danger of not meeting our statutory obligation. Now, we happened to, to have done so at the end of the year, but it wasn't without some pain and without some, some difficulty. So there, there is a constant focus and this is, I'm sure this is true for every board, by the way, there's a constant focus on making sure that you're going to meet your statutory obligations. The only comment I would make, it was heartening to see it's the Orkney submission, one of your charts, well, at least one of your charts is get upper control limits and lower control limits on it, so at least somebody understands Six Sigma methodology, which is great to see. Thank you. Mate, you've made Ivan's day with our chart, I can tell. Uh, <laughs> moving, moving on to some of the wider questions around regionalisation and integration. Um, Brian Whitlow. Yeah, thank you. Good, good morning, panel. Thank you uh, for coming in to give us some evidence. We're, we're kind of well into the uh, into the, the, the integration of health and social care with that, that, that sort of focus of care becoming more community focused. And it's always interesting to hear a lot of your answers, how much you talk about community by necessity uh, because of the area in which you represent. And I wondered how the, the in, that integration is, is progressing in your area uh, and, and the potential challenges that you feel that, that you have um, uh, as, a, as a sort of rural community? Come in yeah, initially. Yes, um, I, th I think it's, if I could set the scene be before I let colleagues speak a little, a little bit more in depth, I think in integration has been something that we've done intuitively in the islands for a, a good number of years. Um, so a lot of the um, joined working took place 
perhaps 10 years ago, um, and we began the process that has since become enshrined in legislation and the creation of integration joint boards. But I think a lot of the potential um, gains, the, the, the way that we've collaborated, have just been a natural way of working in the islands, and perhaps it's because um, we are smaller organisations and, and more inherently we, we do tend to work together. Uh, so, I, so I think that contributes quite significantly to what appear to, appears to be good performance across the board by the island um, boards and the island integration authorities uh, against the, the, the national outcomes and, and the targets. So I think we've, we've started the journey earlier than some and have managed to get quite a way along that, that piece. To, I, I would, however, say that um, the, the legislation and the creation of integration joint boards has possibly um, had a slightly destabilizing effect in the islands because we suddenly then became um, embroiled in a in more of a bureaucratic wrangling exercise about who does what and who's accountable for what, whereas previously we'd, we'd kind of just got on with delivering things jointly anyway. But it, but it has, I think, helped us to uh, learn to understand each other better. So I think the health boards and the councils probably have a much better shared understanding of fundamental issues, and that is allowing us to unlock some further benefits from integration than, than we had done previously. Thank you very much. Neil Gubbray. Yeah, yeah. I echo what Ian's saying and add to it. I think there's a good example that comes out of the fact that we, of course, have in in each area, we have the one council and the one health board. So, therefore, it's been easier for the boards in the islands uh, to work collaboratively. And again, there's a, there's a long history. For example, occupational therapy in the Western Isles has been there for 25 years as a combined arrangement. But the, the boards from the Western Isles point of view, are working well. The first two years were taken up with rather more constitutional questions than was, was reasonable. I think we'd have been happier to begin to address some of the problems. But for example, just to echo Ian's main point there, until we had the integrated boards, the problem of bed blocking was seen as a problem for the health service, not for the council. Whereas we now recognise uh, this is a joint problem. It's because of the inability to provide care that we end up with the bed blocking frequently. So therefore, the fact that you can move together in an integrated group, we've managed to reduce what used to be, in our cases, quite a bit of blockage down a bit. So I think, just to echo Ian's bit as well, it has created a bureaucracy that I'm not sure was absolutely essential, but at least it's taken us out of the silos that did exist before. We understand a lot more from the health point of view of how care is provided and what their concerns are, just as the, the, the council understands that health is actually much more complex than many of them had, had thought. So I can only say it's been an entirely positive experience in the last two and a half years for ourselves. Doesn't mean we agree all the time, by the way. We are, we are known to disagree, but it's, it's done politically and it's done politely. Jerry O'Brien. Uh, echoing my chairman's uh, optimism of 10 or so minutes ago, I think I mean, I would, my opening remark would be I think Orkney is in a good place in relation to integration at the moment. I first joined NHS Orkney as Director of Finance, I think, in September of 2008, and we, 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 we had appointed the first joint director back then, so there's lots of the work uh, at an operational level had, had actually been going on for, for, many, for, for, for many, many years. I uh, agree with Ian. We, we, uh, Neil. We, 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 it's not without. It's not been without its bumps in the road. But I think we're actually in a uh, in a very good place. I think the relations between the the council and the health world are in an extremely positive place, and I think we will move on well. But I think the other aspect of it I would like to touch on. I think especially as we relate to the Isles as opposed to the the mainland of Orkney again, is it's that integration. Uh, with our fire and rescue colleagues, with our third sector colleagues, it's actually taking integration onto its full extent. It doesn't need to stop, or nor should it stop, between council and health board. And it's actually looking at that whole economic sustainability of the Isles as a group. And actually, we've got the opportunities within the island where, where, where it's not just that coterminosity and that single authority aspect. It's the way we necessarily we, with the way we necessarily have to work and how the local population see the sustainability of their local communities, which is the minister, the doctor, the nurse, 
uh, the fire station and it's actually keeping all those things going and the one I, of course I couldn't leave out about my substantive employers at the moment the Scottish Ambulance Service <laughs> <laughs> I think just about everything I was going to say has been said, but uh, as an integrated being or, or person, um, <laughs> maybe I'll give a particular view. And I, I, think, I think Shetland had that foresight to get a joint appointment in post well before the IJB came into being. So, um, uh, again, like Orkney, that, that was, a, I think, a really good move. I think, you know, in terms of the negatives, well, for a small health and care economy, it has brought around some duplication and triplication. I personally didn't foresee the amount of, I guess, bureaucracy at a certain level that would come in terms of having a third body um, that, that needs to report in a number of ways um, come into being, and, and therefore that has created some work, but at the same time, some of it is, is highly useful. I think that in terms of the, the real positive speed of change, I don't think that we would possibly be where we are in Shetland in terms of the um, health and care economy um, being supportive of each other, the level of understanding, a common culture appearing, joint training, etc. Um, the decrease in delayed discharges is probably the biggest key performance indicator that kind of would headline some of the successes, but there are many others behind that. And as, as Jerry had said, um, I mean, you know, in terms of um, transformation, this isn't just about... Um, third sector, it's not just about other statutory bodies, it's very much around a level of leadership that is in the legislation is needing to be shared by more than just an integrated IJB chief officer. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the real positive is, is that is being shown um, and certainly can see that in the way that I have conversations with my counterparts in, in Western Isles and, and Orkney, that um, that level of leadership is across um, the council, is across the, the health board. Um, integrated services and other statutory partners who are coming to the table around this this thing called integration. So I think it's it's more of a social movement in in some ways than just about service delivery. Thank you very much. Very briefly, if you would. I, I mean, it's a fairly leading question because it was obvious from your earlier answers that uh, collaboration is, is is a necessity because of, of, of the reality, reality that you have. So uh, for me, uh, the question would be. Given that you're, you're further down the track than, than most in terms of integration, when do you get the opportunity to share that learning with other other potential uh, IGBs? I mean, very much through, I mean, there's a national chief officers group, so there's an opportunity there. The iHub are supporting um, uh, the, the, the work that's going on. And I think, importantly, that there are a number of other areas uh, in Scotland who are doing great work that we're learning from as well. So, you know, it's a two-way street. Um, and I wouldn't uh, want to suggest that, that Shetland was, um, you know, further down the road than, than anywhere else in particular. Um, although I think that we've, we've seen some, maybe some earlier successes because of size. Um, and I think that whilst there are all of those diseconomies of scale, there is an economy of scale around tests of change. Um, and I think that I would like to see more focus and support from some of those national uh, support agencies coming to Shetland to actually um, test uh, change in, in, a, in the islands um, as well as Shetland um, because I think that it's, it's an ideal opportunity to see results come relatively quickly. You can see the system from end to end. You know, there are some days there are just two steps between myself and, and the very front line, whether that's in health or social care, um, and, and that can be a really good and powerful model for, for testing change and being able to see positive and negative effects of what we do. Thank you very much. And final uh, question from Miles Briggs. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, as the panel will know, it's Mental Health Awareness Week uh, this week, and so I wanted to um, raise issues around mental health services across the islands. Um, the national standard is 90% of patients uh, to commence therapy-based treatment within 18 weeks. The Scottish average currently is 76%, and the islands are standing at 63%. Now, I know from your submissions you highlighted specific workforce challenges around that, but what are you doing as health boards to try to provide that service and, and, and bridge what is clearly quite a gap in terms of what should be expected by patients? If I start and then maybe Simon yep. can give some of the detail. I mean, I, th I think it's a very important issue and I'm, I'm glad you've raised it. As a health board, strategically, we made a decision a couple of years ago to invest additional resources in mental health. 
however difficult that was in terms of our financial resource. So that has been a major focus. Um, and, and we have continued to uh, support the team as that new team has come into place. It's been difficult with some of the recruitment and retention issues. But as a board, we've been very clear that we have to focus on mental health. But in terms of the actual psychological therapies target, Simon might want to add. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're not, not meeting that target at the moment, and, and that's uh, causing us great concern. Um, we actually have the team working this week as a development week because it's Mental Health Awareness Week um, on how we're going to meet that target. And I think that there are a number of things that we can do. I think better signposting um, to, to other agencies where people can get um, lower level intervention quickly. Um, I think that we've got a very small service. We've got two and a half whole time equivalent counsellors. We've got one um, clinical psychologist. The, the level of demand it's been particularly high over, over the last year, and we recognise that. Um, so it doesn't take a lot to tip us over the edge in terms of not meeting the target. Um, we need to broaden the skill set um, out to, to the whole team, uh, including CPNs and mental health workers. Obviously welcome the, the extra money that hopefully will, will be coming shortly um, in terms of the 800 extra mental health workers for Scotland. Um, so the work we're doing at the moment is identifying where the gaps are and doing that, that estimation of what we'll need in the future in order to be able to hit a target of not just 90%, but hopefully 100%, which is our aspiration. Thank you very much. Uh, Neil Chairman, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll be, I'll be very brief. In the Western Isles, we've been reviewing the mental health system for actually the last three years. It had got to a particular stage two years ago, just before uh, the IGB was brought into being, so we widened. Uh, the whole concept of the review to include the IGB and basically we've got five working groups that have been working for the last year and a half. We're hoping to see a report in June and to have an actual policy statement out and a practice implemented in August of this particular year in which we'll see quite a radical shift to the Western Isles. I mean, to all intents and purposes, we're still running a very old mental health system and this is our chance to get into alignment with the government's own policy and mental health and indeed to do something very substantial for the Western Isles. The difficulty, as you will appreciate, is we want to transfer money by definition out of hospitals into the community. If we could get less pressure on our hospitals while that happens, it would be, it would be very helpful. So we've, we have these uh, twin pressures on us, but without a doubt, uh, mental health, certainly as far as the Western Isles is concerned, has been left just rather too long but hopefully, because we've had the whole community involved in it, we're going to come up with what I hope will be seen as a leading, a leading system of mental health provision. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we, we are probably, as a board, not may help out for a couple of years behind where we would like to be. Uh, just listen to Raythe in terms of the investment that they chose to make a couple of years ago, and I think that's, that's where we would like to be. And, and you'll see in their submission in our operational plan for this year, we've, uh, we've put uh, mental health... Uh, at, at the top of our list. Uh, again, I think, similar to Ian, we've had this dependency on a, a visiting service for the last 10 or so years, and we've had a, a variety of locums, and I think the clinical leadership of our, our, our service has, has suffered through that. That's, uh, that's not to detract from the locums in, locums in of them themselves, but it's that clinical leadership. It's a, it's a classic service where uh, our performance, I think, up to about October 2017 was almost at the 80, 100 per cent. We lose one member of staff, which actually happens to represent 50 per cent of the service. We suddenly drop down to 50, 60 per cent. So the challenge for us is to develop that whole system for mental health. So we, we re remove that person dependency, but it takes us very much back to those specialist skills and availability. Uh, so uh, I think there's definitely a commitment from our board. We held a very successful event just pre-Christmas facilitated by the, the Blyde Trust. We've got another event scheduled for July where we're going to distill recommendations from that report to, to establish your mental health framework moving forward. Thank you very much and can I thank the witnesses for what's been a very informative session and uh, uh, we'll adjourn very briefly to allow for a change of witnesses. Thank you very much.
Welcome to the committee, Dr. Martin Chin, uh, Chairman John Burns, Chief Executive, and Derek Lindsay, Director of Finance, all from NHS Air Sharon Arden. This agenda item is part of our scrutiny of NHS boards and follows on from uh, an earlier uh, appearance and also some correspondence between the committee and Air, NHS Ayrshire and Arran Board. And we were keen to uh, hear from you in person and to understand um, more fully what the position is regarding uh, brokerage and your financial position going forward. Now, uh, the upshot of the correspondence between us over the last few months has been essentially that you've advised that the Scottish Government have advised you uh, that you need to uh, return to financial balance and then consider how to repay the brokerage obtained uh, uh, of £23 million for, for the financial year. Now, of course, while the Scottish Government is entitled to make such, uh, give such advice, this is uh, uh, public money and parliamentary funds, and so we are, of course, uh, anxious to know uh, how far your thoughts have come on the question of uh, how and when you hope to repay the loan. Dr. Chin. Okay, thank you very much. I haven't prepared any long opening statement, uh, convener, given the shortage of time we have this morning. So um, if you're content, convener, I think we just go straight into the question and answer session. So that was my first question. What is your time frame? Uh, when do you expect to begin to consider uh, repaying uh, the, the, the loan from the Scottish Government in relation to uh, the financial year? So, so what we've done, we've started a process of, of uh, a number of activities, and I'll ask the Chief Executive to go into some detail uh, in a second. Uh, clearly, uh, achieving financial balance within a year is going to be very difficult, and there'll be a plan will be short, medium and long term. Uh, we can go into that in some detail uh, to enable the committee to understand what it is we're going to achieve. Uh, as a board, we've had uh, two very long uh, workshops in recent weeks uh, to discuss the revenue plan currently for this f financial year and, and the future years. So there's a great, great deal of work being done to try and break down into work streams what it is that we'll need to do and how we need to get to the, the, the point of financial balance. But if I may, convener, I'll have, hand, hand over to the chief exec. Uh, Um, the, the discussions we've had with our colleagues in St Andrew's House is that we are looking to uh, bring forward a three-year plan uh, to uh, address the challenges that we face, recognising that whilst there are uh, short-term uh, initiatives and actions that we uh, continue to take, there are some of the more transformational changes that uh, will take uh, 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 more than one year. But the, the discussions we've had thus far are looking to uh, uh, bring forward a three-year plan. I understand that brokerage has not been required by NHS Air Sharon Arden in the past, um, and I'd therefore be interested in your view as to why uh, a brokerage of this scale was required uh, in, in, the, in the year just gone. Uh, uh, pick up on, on that point, convener. Uh, as you say, Ayrshire hasn't had brokerage. Uh, we have um, uh, worked hard to, to deliver uh, within the, the resource limits that, that are provided. Um, in 2016-17, uh, we uh, started to see uh, some uh, pressures in our system in relation to increasing uh, uh, demand for unscheduled care. Uh, and we also started to see uh, increasing difficulty in recruiting to some of our key medical posts. Uh, those two elements uh, uh, demonstrated pressure in the system. We recognised that we needed to be doing work with our health and social care partnerships. We work very well together in Ayrshire and Arden to redesign uh, how we meet the growing need for unscheduled care in Ayrshire. Uh, Ayrshire has had high levels of use of unscheduled care services, uh, so we recognise we needed to uh, do further work to redesign that, uh, in addition to work that had already taken place. We just opened a new assessment unit. Um, but some of the, as I say, the secondary was around uh, medical uh, vacancies, where we took the view that we had to bring in uh, local medical staff to ensure we maintained safe services to the population whilst trying to review uh, how we would recruit to those 
often hard to fill posts, as well as redesign some of the workforce roles in Ayrshire where we didn't think perhaps in doctors and training grades we might not be able to fill all of the gaps. You described a, a discussion with St Andrew's House with Scottish Government officials which is around a three-year financial plan. Is that a plan for uh, achieving financial balance in three years or is it a plan for repaying the brokerage for this year within three years? Uh, the discussions are about delivering a, a balance in three years and then to discuss repaying the brokerage beyond that point. So essentially your expectation is that you will require further brokerage over the two following years? Regrettably, we believe that would be the case. I bring in Brian Whittle. Good evening and good morning. Um, if, I, if I may, I was going to use a, a couple of examples. Uh, the, the, you have um, outlined plans at the moment to close the cancer centre at Ayr and shift that to uh, uh, amalgamate that with the one at Cross House in Kilmarnock. Um, looking at that from a patient care perspective, uh, we, um, I've had an awful lot of, of mail around this, as you might imagine. For example, if you if you live in Ballantrae, that's uh, over a three-hour journey on public transport to get your cancer treatment, and then a three-hour uh, three hour back. Uh, even from a practical perspective, if you drive, you know as well as I do, uh, there are no parking facilities, or, or, or the park facilities there are, are already inadequate. So in, the, in, in that decision, was that a consideration? And I know that the, the, the plan is to have sort of four outlying hubs within the community. The, I think the simple question is, is this decision based around patient care? Um, can, uh, in your current financial situation, can you deliver uh, four community hubs? Or was this decision basically financial? This decision, though well, the decision hasn't been taken yet. This is still a proposal. Since we were uh, last here in December, we have been discussing with our colleagues in the West of Scotland uh, Regional Cancer Network how we would look to shape the delivery of uh, chemotherapy services uh, going forward. And the West of Scotland uh, work, which is uh, uh, progressing, uh, would see uh, the uh, hub model that you, des you describe. Um, it, does, uh, it is very much about delivering uh, the right care to patients, recognising the complexity uh, of some of those treatments, but equally trying to do that as locally as possible. So we will now work uh, with colleagues in the Regional Cancer Network to determine uh, the best way to deliver chemotherapy services in Ayrshire that recognises the points that, that you've made. But I can say absolutely that the drive for this is not an efficiency. It's not about saving money. Uh, this is about delivering uh, the right care and the best care we can uh, to, to patients in Ayrshire. So what cognizance then is given to the, the, the sort of transport infrastructure, the public transport infrastructure then for patients in what is a very wide uh, area, it's a big area, uh, especially if you take air out of that, uh, the sort of south of Scotland, uh, the, the transport infrastructure getting to Cross House is particularly difficult. So how, how are you uh, proposing to deal with that? Well, that will need to be part of the ongoing dialogue uh, in terms of any changes uh, in the future. Uh, we will engage appropriately with patients and our communities. Uh, and I think the, the, the most appropriate way to do that now is to uh, uh, work with the evidence and the uh, medical advice around how to best meet the needs of our population uh, in Ayrshire. I think this is also an opportunity because I think over time, if we can uh, uh, deliver uh, a, a model going forward, then it may, uh, subject to clinical priorities and clinical pathways, allow us to repatriate some chemotherapy back into Ayrshire where individuals may currently go to Glasgow. So I think there's a wider uh, benefit, but we need to be able to be clear about those in relation to that West of Scotland model and how it can be properly delivered in Ayrshire, recognising the points you make and recognising the transport issues that exist. There is still work to do. So how, how are you then going to um, um, speak with the, the, the public, general public and, and when do you expect to come out with a, a reaction or response to that? I, I would expect us to have a better understanding of the uh, regional cancer, uh, West of Scotland, uh, chemotherapy uh, uh, model uh, 
uh, I, I would think by, by late June, uh, given the discussions we've had to date, uh, then we would want to, and I think there is a, a regional dimension to this in terms of how we go forward, but in terms of Ayrshire, I would want to then have a, a clear and proper uh, engagement with patients, staff and our community in terms of why any change would need to take place, what the benefits of that change would be, uh, and how we would seek to deliver that uh, in a way that, that tries to address, where we can, uh, some of the concerns uh, that our uh, patients and population have and staff have. If I may, just one more. As you're aware, that there was an HS review into the neonatal unit at Cross House, uh, and in the back of that, I think it's, uh, there's 24 staff the 24 staff that were brought into the, the, the neonatal unit. To me, that suggests a, a, a system under pressure, under that financial pressure. If you're 24 staff short, uh, you must have known that. So uh, uh, that, that's, that's money that's now being spent that I don't think you are budgeting for. Um, so uh, I think we're trying to get here. What kind of financial pressure are you, uh, are you under? And that, and that patient service that uh, obviously was, was missing uh, within uh, Cross House. Um, uh, that's a financial issue. Yes, we, we invested in nursing staff in 2016-17, uh, including the maternity unit. Uh, we had made those decisions in advance of the Healthcare Improvement Scotland review. Uh, they were based on uh, the, uh, re the, the workforce, nursing workforce tools. Uh, and the reviews that uh, our nurse director had made uh, and the board uh, uh, considered that advice um, and uh, given the evidence that was presented, we felt that it was right and proper that we invested staff into the maternity unit, which, which we did. So my point is, if you're 24 staff short uh, in the first instance, there is financial pressure there, which is, which is, ne is now in evidence, of course, because you're £23 million. Pounds. In, in the red, so I think what we're trying to establish here is, is you know, within the financial management of, of what you're doing just now, have you got enough money? You know, are you getting enough money through there, and how are you managing to redistribute uh, those finances to the best possible mm -hmm. patient care outcomes? So, so our our focus is on trying to ensure we deliver uh, uh, within the funds we have. We've clearly not managed that. Uh, we wouldn't have had brokerage. Uh, we are looking at this. Um, uh, the two immediate uh, uh, threads are the uh, short-term immediate uh, changes we can make uh, in the, the areas that you would expect us to be looking at around procurement, around efficient prescribing, effective prescribing, looking at our workforce costs uh, to make sure that we are uh, uh, reducing our reliance and use of agency and locum spend where we can to bring those uh, uh, exceptional costs down. Uh, but in addition to that, we recognise that that's not enough in itself. Um, we need to look at uh, how we change our service model uh, in Ayrshire, and we have a number of areas of activity underway. Unscheduled care is one. Uh, we're looking at our outpatient uh, services, uh, we want to make sure that we um, uh, can eradicate any waste or unwarranted variation in our processes to make them as efficient as they can be. Um, and we're looking at uh, how we use and utilise our estate. So there's a number of uh, work streams and threads underway, both in a, a short 1819 focus, but also uh, uh, 1819, 1920, 2021. A last question, if I could. Um, the, the next question that would be, are there other units within Ayrshire and Arne that you feel are um, in the same situation as the neonatal unit was in Cross House that is going to need to be addressed? Uh, there is nothing that is um, on our uh, immediate radar, no. Uh, the... Uh, nursing workforce, as because they, there are workforce tools, then they are reviewed um, on a, 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 well, certainly we've just had a review and we're waiting on the findings of that. Uh, but given that we have invested in our nursing workforce, given that we are uh, looking very closely at our workforce costs, where there is nothing that we are uh, seeing immediately that, that uh, we've not been uh, including in our planning. Thank you very much. Emma Harper.
Thank you. It's just a quick sub, sub actually, about cancer pathways, regionalisation. We have the same issues in Stranraer when people go to Edinburgh for their cancer care. Um, but as part of the regional review, which I'm aware of, I'm interested if you know if uh, evidence of increased mortality and travel times is is part of a consideration. And I mean, I've been uh, asked to look at the evidence of travel times or mortality. I know that some chemo can be given orally, and so that makes it easier to give more locally. I know that some chemo, you have to remain four hours post chemo, some even longer, some is given via central venous access and some IV. So there's loads of different ways that chemo is given. So obviously that is part of a decision. But I'm curious about travel times and mortality and any evidence whether increased travel causes an increase in mortality. I don't have the information to answer that question. It's not something that I have uh, looked at. Um, we will, uh, and, I, and the things you've pointed out, but we will uh, uh, be taking and reviewing uh, all of the evidence that comes forward through the, uh, the West of Scotland work um, and in terms of uh, our consideration of how we deliver those services, recognising the different ways in which we can now uh, deliver chemotherapy services to the population, but I don't have specifics on that question. So is there a way we can find out if there is, um, I guess, tra travel time impacts on people's ability to recover better or are outcomes related to travel times? That's certainly a question I can ask uh, the, the team looking at this. Okay. Okay, thanks. Happy to provide some information back. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Can I ask, we've talked about a three-year plan that you've described and um, said that I think you said that you expect brokerage to be required in each of the next two years. What scale of brokerage are you contemplating in the next two years? Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, obviously, the, the amount of brokerage that will be required will be related to how much funding increase we receive in future years. And I know that uh, the government is planning to publish a, a medium-term financial plan uh, which follows on from the, the UK um, financial plan. So th that's a factor in it. Um, at the moment, uh, we obviously have to think about 2018-19. The plan that we submitted in um, in March of this year was, was uh, projecting a potential £20 million required for next year, however, uh, for 18-19. However, uh, that will also be um, have to reflect the pay awards, which we, we don't yet know. The negotiations are going on at the moment as to what pay will be and the additional funding that we'll receive as a result of um, Treasury funding the, the Agenda for Change pay awards in England and the consequentials that come to Scotland. So there are, are many contributory factors to that, but uh, we, we certainly are in close discussion with the Scottish Government about the different scenarios, and we have said that around the end of May we would expect uh, a lot of these things to, to be clearer. When, when you gave evidence in December, at that point you expected a shortfall of £20 million pounds for this financial year. That increased by a further £3 million subsequently for reasons which you've described. Do, should we therefore assume that the number you've given us today for this year is really only a provisional starting point rather than a final expectation? It, it is a provisional figure and, and uh, the discussions that we've had with Scottish Government would recognise the, the variables that are there, um, things like uh, our prescribing costs, uh, etc. Are, are also uh, provisional figures based on best estimates, but we, we do hope to be able to firm those up in the near future. And in particular, pay is our biggest single cost, so we need to be clear on both the funding and the uh, planned expenditure for pay. I may add to that. I mean, it's interesting, in, in the, the December uh, board report, we actually forecast a 24.2 million uh, deficit. Uh, so it is a variable figure uh, and one which uh, is a moving feast at all times. So 24.2 down to 22.9, not ideal by any means, but it demonstrates the movability of these numbers. But I think it's true to say that when you gave evidence here in the same month you were predicting 20 rather than 24 yes, I, million. That's, 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 right. that's correct, Convener. Yeah. I think the, um, the, the, 
this is a provisional position. There is more work that we have underway uh, uh, within the board. Um, as uh, uh, Derek has indicated, we have agreed with uh, our colleagues in St Andrew's House that we will meet with them again uh, towards the end of May, very beginning of June, uh, where we will uh, set out the next part of the detail in terms of our uh, revenue plan for 1819 and what we see in terms of the transformational work going into 1920 and beyond. Thank you very much. And finally, can I ask the chairman, uh, is, it, is it safe to assume that this has been discussed in detail at board level? Uh, and if so, uh, wh where does the board believe responsibility lies for the shortfall you've experienced? Uh, so the answer to the uh, convener is yes. Uh, we've had uh, most recently two four-hour uh, board workshops running from about four in the afternoon to late in the evening, uh, going through this in a great deal of depth and detail and trying to um, give the chief exec and his corporate management team a degree of support and direction as to what might be uh, uh, acceptable to, to move forward with, with the budget plan. Um, so we've got to a position where uh, we'll be taking that to the board meeting uh, in May uh, and there'll be a, 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 an understanding. At the moment, we're running on a, a revenue, last year's revenue rolled forward because we don't have an agreed budget yet. Uh, but I can assure you that uh, board members are fully involved and uh, in, in great deal of detail on the discussions. That's helpful. And uh, you've mentioned a board meeting in May and also meetings with the Scottish Government towards the end of the month. It would be very helpful, I think, to the committee if you were able to let us know uh, the outcome of those and regard to your financial projections. Thank you very much. One last very brief question. No, it's not a question. Just, I, should have, I should have declared an interest at the start. I have a, a close family member who's a healthcare professional in the National Army Health Board. Thank you for putting that on the record and can I thank the witnesses for coming today and for giving evidence. Thank you. We will now move into private session um, and uh, consider the rest of the agenda thereafter. <laughs>